Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. Vintage radio item with little known facts or lore. The Phillips Philata Model 204U of 1941. A new line of compact ACDC receivers using 8-pin Loctal style tube bases patterned after the original 1938 Sylvania brand tubes made in the USA. A radio designed not only for the Dutch homeland, but exported to countries far and wide. There were three basic versions of the chassis. The 203U has long wave and medium wave. The 204U has medium wave and short wave. And the 208U, introduced in 1943, has all three bands. This advertisement is for Finland. Philips had manufacturing or assembly operations in many countries. More on this later. The 208U could be found under about 16 different brand names in the German and Austrian markets, such as Nora, Brandt, Umig, and Gretz, etc. A very rare find indeed. The packing box for a 203U. Note that the cardboard carton has a laminated paper sheet printed to make it look like a wooden crate. The model that found its way into my collection is the model 204U-19, made for the Swedish market. There were more than 50 versions of these radios exported to many lands. First, a little historical background. From before World War I, being located between the United Kingdom and Germany, the Netherlands attempted to operate as a neutral country. The Rhine River was essential to German trade and raw materials. Any attempt for the country to restrict access to the North Sea would have been seen as an instant provocation. Conservative Dutch governments of the time always chose not to invest in building up a military despite the brazen rearmament of Germany undertaken after the rise of Hitler's Nazi party to power in early 1933. When Hitler ordered the invasion of the Low Countries, it was less than a week in May of 1940 before the Netherlands realized that defense was not an option. My 204U was made in the Netherlands during that period of German occupation. Just before the country was invaded in 1940, Philips moved its corporate headquarters to Curaçao in the Netherlands Antilles. Overseas subsidiaries were spun off and as much technical knowledge and copies of machine tools were exported to Britain and the USA as possible. Leaving literally hours before shipping possibilities were terminated, one of the three ships carrying equipment was destroyed at sea. The Antoine Phillips family took refuge in the USA and Britain. Frederick Fritz Phillips and his immediate family decided to stay in place and Fritz hoped to keep the Phillips factories running to provide employment for tens of thousands of his countrymen. I highly recommend this autobiography of Frederick Phillips. Long out of print, but often available at used bookstores for less than $25. Prior to 1943, the Germans thought that they would be able to convert the country to the new order, and thus really did not intend to destroy infrastructure. As far as the Phillips Industries were concerned, to a large degree, they were permitted to run under their own management structures, the management being held accountable to German managers called Verwalters, whose mandate was to see that manufacturing output would aid in supporting German military and Nazi 
political objectives, most notably the production of commodity vacuum tubes for their homeland receivers, and eventually some 30% of Philips tube manufacturing was directed towards German military radio equipment. Even though Philips had some of the best research and engineering staff in the world, Germany did not trust their cooperation and therefore did not conscript them into working on secret military projects. Phillips had no desire to actively contribute to this conversion and time and time again found inventive ways to retard production schedules but still maintain jobs. While cheap ACDC radios had been made in the USA since about 1932, Phillips did not manufacture a really compact ACDC receiver until this Falletta model of 1941, designed around their first series of 8-pin Loctal style tubes designed for home broadcast receivers. This type of tube construction scheme was first employed by Phillips in the circa 1939 type EF50 9-pin tube. For military high-frequency applications and television, this proved to be one of the most useful tubes in the early war years. Time to talk about some interesting features of these radios. As mentioned, there were over 50 variants manufactured for export. This 204U-19 was exported to Sweden. Swedish safety standards required that the mains cord must be disconnected from the radio if any safety covers were removed. Therefore, a two-pin receptacle was attached to the ventilated metal back cover. This metal cover also served as an antenna for local reception. Chassis Conservation As far as I can determine, no chassis components have ever been replaced. Only two tubes, the rectifier and audio output tube, have been replaced. The tube lineup makes use of their first application of a glass button base with connection pins molded in place and a metal collar with center locking pin. First seen in the Sylvania Loctal tubes of 1938. The Loctal tube sockets used their center pin as an additional electrical connection. The walls of this center socket location often become cracked. This was true at one of the replaced tubes. Fortunately, the pieces remained and were glued in place with CA adhesive. If I had to do it over again, I would consider using rubber-filled CA adhesive. It should be more forgiving of stress. With only this minor repair, the radio remains an accurate historical reference as to the original construction of the product. A feature unique to Philips radios from 1937 to as late as 1955 in some designs is their scheme for adjusting the inductance of the antenna, oscillator, and intermediate amplifier transformers. The soft aluminum can is rolled on a special lathe to bring the wall closer to the coils, thus lowering their inductance. This method of tuning meant that the tolerances of other components and placement of interconnecting wiring had to be precisely determined and assembly adhered to. This RF transformer and inductor design was carried over to Philips licensed operations in Eastern Bloc countries well into the 1950s. The first two variations shown here are a IF transformer and a oscillator coil. At right is a larger coil assembly that is seen in more complex receivers and includes a deck of piston type trimmer capacitors at the top of the can. Here, IF coils are being checked for continuity and verification that the coil inductance is slightly higher than required for the receiver design.
Here is a view of the inductance tuning lathe. The assembly is securely captured on a rotating mandrel and the operator brings a rolling wheel to contact the side of the can. Pressure forms a groove that approaches the maximum diameter of the winding bobbin, thus lowering its effective inductance, so that the circuit it is wired into will resonate at 452 kHz. There is a neon bulb soldered in place to serve as a power on indicator. Due to its size, I thought it might be large enough to illuminate the dial, but I have been told that this is not its intended purpose. The 204U-19 has two bands, medium wave and short waves, with a range of 5.88 to 20 megahertz. This perspective view highlights the Swedish two-pin mains disconnect requirement. The round plug mounted on the back of the chassis selects 125 or 220 volt mains use. Other dash number sets might include different mains voltage ranges such as 150 volts as used in Hungary at the time. Because of wide range mains voltage operation without the benefit of a mains power transformer, the design uses a permanent magnet type loudspeaker. This, like a large percentage of European speaker designs of the day, makes use of a cloth bag to keep contamination out of the voice coil area. Highly effective, but never done here in the USA. Robust tuning capacitor assembly. Note that there are none of the usual compression type tremor capacitors on the frame as seen on USA type receivers. The tremors are adjustable tubular ceramic capacitors wired under the bottom of the chassis as will be described in a few slides from now. Green arrows. These Phillips paper and foil coupling and decoupling capacitors are inserted into a paper sleeve and overmolded with a tar-like compound said to be highly resistant to high humidity environments. This is consistent with their strategy to sell into global markets with so-called tropicalized chassis. They are reported to have exhibited a long service life, but certainly should not be considered suitable for operation today. Red arrows. Many Phillips radios of this period make extensive use of little tinned copper sleeves formed by winding a solid wire into a coil. It makes for a very secure splice or tap with generous solder contact. This large wire wound resistor value is dependent on the mains voltages available to power the set. Little cup ceramic beads are strung on wires passing from the hot resistor, a highly effective way to ensure that the insulation will never char and short through to the chassis. From the late 1920s, German manufacturers were making high-value film resistors applied on ceramic tubes by a spray process or deposition of a carbon-rich gas such as propane in a high temperature retort. Afterwards, end caps were applied and then some versions had a spiral groove cut through the film to raise the film resistance to the desired value. A protective coating was then applied resulting in a very stable high value resistor. In general, these processes required more protection time than the extruded carbon clay composition resistors seen in American radios from the early 1930s onward. So despite their superiority, they were not used here, since many consumer radio circuit designs here really did not require precision resistances. 10 to 20% tolerances were generally okay outside of the power supply divider string.
Phillips also made use of notoriously fragile ceramic tube capacitors in their RF circuits. I do not know how they were made since I do not have any extras to dissect and have not discovered any info on the web. I presume that the inside of the very thin ceramic tubes were coated with metal bearing paste and maybe the same paste sprayed on the outside and then fired. Then leads were flow soldered to the inside and outside. Again, a fabrication technique that seems to be very precise and stable, but they seem to be extremely easy to damage during assembly. The photo highlights the need for highly skilled, probably women, to work in these close quarters. More ceramic cylinders are used for small value tremor capacitors as shown by the green arrows. This time the inside of a somewhat thicker ceramic tube is filled with conductive metal only halfway. On the outside is a dry wound single layer spiral of fine tinned copper wire that appears to have been then subjected to a short blast of hot air, just enough to lightly fuse the tin wire into a cylinder. This spiral of wire can be pushed along the tube to adjust the capacity. The spiral is then secured with a drop of wax during final testing. These serve as the tremor capacitors for the antenna and oscillator tuning capacitor assembly mentioned on slide number 19. Conservation of the cabinet. The cabinet is cracked on the top and right side. My technique is to reinforce the back side of the crack with two layers of woven fiberglass cloth. After making sure that the two sides of the crack are absolutely coplanar, I lightly sand the inside and clean with acetone or alcohol. I lay one sheet of the fiberglass mat on the back of the crack. Using a pipette, I drop super thin CA adhesive onto the fiberglass until the cloth is saturated. I then quickly lay a thin sheet of mylar film over the fiberglass. With the mylar film in place, I can simply use my finger to force out any air bubbles in the glue. After a few minutes, the CA will begin to harden and the mylar sheet is easily peeled off. A second layer of fiberglass is laid in place and more CA adhesive applied with a pipette, followed by the sheet of mylar film to help force out air bubbles again. After a few minutes, you can pull the mylar film to complete the cure and brush on CA adhesive cure accelerant to obtain a maximum cure. Filling the top side of the crack is difficult when you have a swirled coloration in the Bakelite. I'm not going to get perfect results. I usually look for a damaged Bakelite knob in my junk box. Using a dull file, I make a little pile of Bakelite dust. I can then pack the dust into chips along the edge of a crack and very carefully use the pipette to apply a tiny bit of the CA adhesive. After the resin is cured, I can sand it level and begin to blend the patch into the good Bakelite. When doing the initial wet sanding, I protect the surrounding Bakelite with the thinnest version of packing tape I have. This makes it possible to come very close to level without scuffing good cabinet surface. My favorite low-cost method of polishing out Bakelite is to use the Turtle Wax Headlight Lens Restorer Kit. It really works quickly, but it is easy to control. It costs about $10 at any auto parts store and lasts for many repairs. More than likely, you will want to either wax the finished work or maybe even spray a thin coat of clear lacquer to keep the filler in the sanded Bakelite from showing too much. Despite all the perceived complexity of this design in the eyes of many American collectors, European historians estimate 
that well over one million of this first series of Falettas were manufactured, with most of them having been manufactured in the Netherlands. This receiver employs many construction techniques simply never seen here in the USA. Some of it can be credited to Philips' desire to come up with their own patent portfolio that would not require them to pay license fees to other companies. Another reason is that in many cases, the levels of technical skills within the workforce due to a carryover of the concepts of learning through apprenticeships led to higher levels of workmanship. In general, this having higher manufacturing standards meant that their products could not compete directly on cost to American products. But that was of little importance since this was a time where nationalist protectionist policies to a large degree shut out foreign competitors. Phillips' response to this was to establish manufacturing or assembly operations in a number of countries so that profits could be generated by selling parts, technical and business services to these affiliate entities. Before 1950, factories are known to have existed in Germany, Hungary, Italy, Czechoslovakia, the UK, France, Belgium, Denmark, Spain, India, Australia, Sweden, Finland, and Poland. There may have been others. From late 1942, Allied forces had determined that too much of the vacuum tube production was going into German military and German domestic receiver use. The Royal Air Force conducted a bombing raid planned as Operation Oyster, directed to take out the tube works in Eindhoven on the 6th of December 1942. Back in England, the returning aircraft were met at their airfields by waiting newspapermen who swarmed about the crews and took pictures of the damaged airplanes. That night, parties were held and a concert given with household names from the world of radio entertainment. The next day, the raid was celebrated in the press. The crews were all placed on three-day leave. For Fritz Phillips, chairman of Phillips, the destruction came as a shock. Dutch nationalists, like Phillips, had to walk a tightrope. He had to give the appearance of collaborating with his German occupiers while providing a minimal effort to support the German war industry. Phillips had been hamstringing the plant's production for some time, but the overstated reports he had been sending to Germany had apparently found their way to the British Air Ministry. Facing the reality, of the destruction the following morning, Philip's first concern was that his skilled workers might be relocated to Germany. He immediately set about putting his people to work, clearing the debris, providing the German overseers with optimistic projections of the plant's return to function. He made certain the repairs proceeded in a deliberate manner. In May the following year, the Gestapo put Phillips in a concentration camp for five months because he had failed to put an end to a strike. The RAF sent 10 mosquitoes to revisit the Phillips plants on the 30th of March, 1943, to slow the recovery. It took an additional six months to restore production. Eindhoven was liberated on the 18th of September, 1944. An intelligence inspection of the Phillips plants noted the passive resistance of the Phillips leadership and the distrust of their German overseers. It asserted, however, that the most effective sabotage agency in action at Phillips had, in fact, been the German system of allocation and control. So here you have a rather unpretentious small table model radio in a brown Bakelite case from the early 1940s. Turns out that it is one of the highest production radios made anywhere in the world during the day. 
with construction techniques virtually unknown here in the USA. Built under a fascinating set of circumstances that, if we take the time to examine them, can bring us to a much higher level of appreciation of vintage equipment and the circumstances in which they were created. I want to thank enthusiasts of the UK Vintage Radio Repair and Restoration Discussion Forum, Radio Historisch Zeitschrift, and especially Giddy Vahalian for their assistance. You can click on this QR code to be taken to a very fine example of Giddy's style of writing. Yes, this article is in Dutch, but don't be intimidated by foreign languages any longer. Google Translate is a very easy tool to use, and it is free. Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates.